welcome everyone to our webinar on passive solar greenhouses with Gianni of Fresh Pal Farms in Old Alberta. For those of you that have never attended one of our events before, uh, Rural Roots to Climate Solutions is an Alberta-based organization working out of the Settler Learning Center. Uh, and we host workshops, uh, field days, webinars, and farm tours um, across the entire province, empowering rural Albertans with climate solutions. So we work with farmers, producers, and all rural Albertans uh, to create a space for discussions uh, to happen about climate solutions. And we're strong advocates of the idea that climate solutions can also be farm solutions. Uh, so Gianni, I'm just going to make sure that you're not muted here. So if you wanna uh, share your screen and give us a hello, I'll give you a thumbs up that we can hear you and then you can get going. Okay, thank you so much, Marie. Perfect, I can hear uh, you. You can hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? I can see it, yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. And uh, the red dot is the mouse. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, hi everyone, my name is Jian Yi Dong. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a vegetable grower at Oz, and I build a Chinese-style passive solar greenhouse. Uh, today, I'm very happy to show you how it looks and how it works for me. Uh, this is the outline of today's presentation. So I'm going to show you some examples of Chinese-style passive solar greenhouses in China and the design pr principles for such greenhouses and the design of my greenhouse and how my greenhouse performed during uh, the past year. I have been running this greenhouse for a whole year. And according to its performance, I made a growing plan. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's see some pictures of the passive solar greenhouses in China. Uh, if you don't see this picture, you may not believe that there are so many passive solar greenhouses in China, millions of them. Uh, in North China. You know, North China sometimes it gets minus 10 degrees to minus 30 degrees. So the climate is uh, similar to Alberta. Uh, but uh, I see a big difference. In China, I see uh, passive solar greenhouses everywhere. But in Alberta, I don't see so many, especially the uh, commercial size. So these red buildings are the villages. And in between, it's all passive solar greenhouses. So it's millions, million of them. Um, I used to be a geologist, but why I ended up to be a vegetable grower uh, is because of this difference. So I think there might be an opportunity uh, to build such a greenhouse. Uh, if we zoom in, we can see every uh, each one of them is a passive solar greenhouse and they are independent. They are not connected. And if we uh, further zoom in, we can see the front side. So this is the south side, it's a front side and it's covered by a poly uh, a plastic. And you can see a window in, on the bottom and there's another window on the top and this row is uh, uh, insulated blankets, which is rolled up and down by a electric motor. And this is a look inside. This is the south side. And so the passive solar greenhouse in North China always face south to receive uh, maximum sunlight. And uh, we always see a back wall, uh, which is uh, usually made of a berm of clay. So uh, you can see this berm. The berm can be very huge, 10 meters tall and 10 meters thick. So it, it can absorb a lot of heat. And uh, so that makes the, the wall a heat pool. And the wall can be also made of brick and the concrete, which makes it look uh, more beautiful. And the insulated blankets will be lowered all the way to the bottom during the night. 
to trap the heat inside the greenhouse. And this is me working in such a, a, a greenhouse in China. Uh, this place is uh, has a similar weather. So in winter, it's also minus 20 degrees, but the farmer there can grow uh, tomatoes uh, in, in the winter time without any artificial heating source. So the only heat source is sunlight. Um, is, there are so many such farmers in China. They, uh, each family probably owns only one acre land or less than one acre. So how they um, make a living, they just build such a greenhouse, uh, one or two on their land, and this only one or two greenhouse can support their whole family. So now we can uh, talk about the designing principle for a passive solar greenhouse, a Chinese style passive solar greenhouse. So a Chinese style passive solar greenhouse is always elongated, is striking from the west to east, and is always facing the south uh, to receive maximum sunlight. And there are two very important elements in such a greenhouse. One is this berm. So the berm can be very big and it, it, receive, it absorbs a lot of heat from sunlight during the day and during the warm season and during the night and the cold season, it re release the heat gradually. So uh, during the night, there's uh, no heat source, no artificial heat source at all. So this uh, berm is the heat source for the greenhouse. And uh, uh, you need a insulated blankets to cover the whole greenhouse during the night. So it traps the heat inside the greenhouse. This combination of these two elements makes sure uh, the greenhouse stays warm at night. So this is how it works for the Chinese style passive solar greenhouse. And this is the principle of my greenhouse. Um, so you can see there are two layers. Um, we make it two layers because uh, in Alberta, the weather is much more challenging than uh, most part of North China. So we put another layer or a bigger greenhouse outside the, uh, the regular uh, passive solar greenhouse. Uh, that's because here we have too much uh, snow. So we make it taller and this angle bigger. So most of the snow will just uh, fall. And um, it, in North China, there's not much snow in winter. So their insulated blankets won't get wet. But here, um, we have too much snow. Uh, if, we, if we don't have this layer, the insulated blankets may get wet. And then we will have trouble rolling it up and down. And there's a sketch showing you uh, the design of my uh, greenhouse. So the bottom is about 10 meters and half, 10 and a half meters uh, wide, and the maximum height is six meters. And uh, this is the outer layer. And the inner layer, the maximum height is four meters. And this is the back wall. It's made of uh, steel pipes too, steel pipes plus um, uh, metal sheeting. And inside is filled with clay. Uh, and it's um, 100 meters long. So it's 1,000 square meters or 10,000 square feet. Uh, this is the insulated blankets. Uh, uh, there's a, a electric motor rolling it up and down. And this is a window on the top. It's controlled by an electric motor too. And there's um, another motor to roll up uh, the polyfilm. And inside, there's another motor roll up. So there's a venting here, and uh, you can also vent through here and this window. And in winter time, we have a very cool machine. This is a snow vibrator. So when uh, it accumulates, it accumulates uh, snow on top, uh, so the snow cannot accumulate on this part because the angle is very high and it slides down. But here is still, there's still some snow. So we turn on the vibrator and the snow will automatically fall down. So we don't need to burn anything to melt the snow. 
uh, is very energy efficient. This is how it actually looks. This is the south side, the front side, and uh, this is the north side. So this is the back wall uh, covered by insulated blankets. And this is uh, looking from inside. And this back wall, this is the uh, metal sheeting. Behind that is all clay. And it's four meters tall. And the greenhouse is, I would say, is a commercial size. So it's pretty big. I can drive my little tractor inside to do the roto tilling to spread the uh, compost. And this is the look between two layers. This is the outer layer polyfilm, and this is the in insulated blankets and when it's rolled down. And uh, you can see a window. The window is controlled by a motor, and this is the snow vibrator. And the 100 meter long insulated blankets is rolled up and down by a small, small, uh, electric motor. It's a three horsepower and this um, insulated blanket is, is probably three tons, weighs three tons, but this small motor can do the, uh, the job. And actually there's new types of uh, insulated blankets. It's much, much lighter and uh, it's more warm, it's warmer. And this, this is a video. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, this is a video showing you uh, how it looks when I'm opening the insulated blankets. So the whole blanket is opened at the same time by the electric motor. And when I lower it, it's totally blacked out. So the whole thing is rolled up at the same time. It takes about eight minutes to go to the top. This is a uh, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, January this year when it was very very cold, and you can see some dew uh, on the poly. Uh, I recorded the temperature inside the greenhouse and uh, outside, uh, so to make a comparison. Uh, let me turn this back. So this uh, uh, red uh, curve is the temperature inside the greenhouse. The blue curve is the air temperature. Uh, so in October, you can see the minimum air temperature is close to minus 20, right? And uh, we what we pay attention to is the maximum temperature in the greenhouse, which we which are kept uh, below 30 uh, because we can open the window, open or close the window to regulate the temperature inside the greenhouse. And more importantly is the minimum temperature during the night. So this one cycle is a day, and we see a maximum and a minimum. So uh, before the end of October, it was kept uh, about 10 degrees. Uh, it was like perfect for me. The tomatoes and cucumbers were doing really well. Uh, in uh, late October, you start to cool down. The outside temperature dropped down to minus 20, but it was just two days. So uh, the minimum temperature during the night in the greenhouse dropped down to five, but it was not too bad. And it bounced back to about 10 degrees. Uh, in November, the temperature was still not too bad. Uh, so the, for a couple of days, we can see uh, the minimum drop down to five or even a little lower when it was extremely cold, minus 25. Uh, but uh, most of the time it's around 10. It was not too bad. But coming into December, uh, it become too cold and too dark because our sunlight, we, we don't have much sunlight, only for the greenhouse, we only have four to five hour effective sunlight. And uh, there's too much cloud cover. For example, there's uh, one week continuously cloudy and snowy. 
uh, so the temperature dropped down to close to zero. But compared to uh, the temperature outside, minus 20, minus 15, uh, is still not too bad. And there was no frost in the greenhouse. Uh, it, but in January, the temperature dropped down to, uh, there was a, a day dropped down to minus 38, almost minus 40. Uh, so the temperature in the greenhouse dropped down to zero, uh, even a little bit lower than zero. So this is how it was performing last year. Uh, let's see some <clears throat> some pictures of the plants in the greenhouse. This picture was taken in the end of October. So you can see the tomatoes were still vigorous. The leaves are really green and uh, the tom tomatoes are, are, were still ripening fast. And this is uh, almost end of uh, December, uh, just before uh, Christmas. So it was pretty cold and it was uh, too wet. The wind is very cold. Uh, the relative uh, humidity comes up. So we had to prune most of the leaves. And but you can see there's still a lot of tomatoes because uh, we don't have, um, or the cost is, is relatively, is really low for me because I don't, I'm not burning anything. So I'm still keeping them. And I can still harvest some uh, uh, tomatoes in December. Uh, this is the, how the cucumber is doing in late uh, October. This, uh, this is the sweet mini cucumbers. They are still doing good. And there's the big cucumbers. They were also doing good. And the peppers, the bell peppers, and the sm small hot peppers, the small hot peppers turned red in December. They need a long time to turn red. And these are the pole beans. So in late October, they are still blossoming and fruiting. And in December, December 15th, we can still pick some uh, beans. In in July, this is July the 10th, just uh, it's a couple of days before the extreme cold came. Uh, minus 38 degree, just before that. So they were not uh, frozen, they were still ripening. And I can still pick some uh, tomatoes every week. But uh, for a commercial greenhouse, it doesn't make so much sense to grow tomatoes in December because not only is too cold, but also too dark. So I pulled most of the tomatoes and cucumbers out and then I replaced them with uh, uh, greens and leafy veggies. So under this uh, plastic is the greens like dill weed. Is, uh, they were sold in December and they germinate in early January. And this uh, this is uh, reddish. They were sold in late October. They are, they are they were slower, but uh, they were still growing January. And brown daisy in January they are pretty tall. I, I can cut them at that time. And uh, some garlic sprouts. We cover them with a black plastic to block any sunlight and so they turn yellow and it's very tender and they are very hardy so uh, I harvest them in January. Uh, this is how my greenhouse look uh, right now this year. So it's mostly tomatoes and cucumbers. Uh, now I, I just transplanted some small plants of uh, cucumbers. It was pole beans here. And now I pull them out and replace them with cucumbers. And now I have some mini cucumbers too. A very sweet variety. And uh, about two thirds of the greenhouse was used to grow tomatoes. 
So I have a cherry tomatoes and beefsteak tomatoes. So this picture shows you the beefsteak. This, uh, this is a wire used to hang the plants. Uh, it's two meters tall. But the, the vines are way more than two meters. So if we zoom in, you can see, for example, this wine is pretty long. So we had to lower them. But this year I didn't uh, use the correct tool. So I'm always behind the schedule lowering the tool, lowering the, uh, the plants. But uh, you can see this wine is uh, more than five meters and uh, <clears throat> 12 trusses of those were already picked. And two trusses are red. And before, say, I can keep them at the end of uh, November, there are still two or three trusses can be picked. So totally maybe 15 or 16 trusses can be harvested this year. So I'm pretty happy about this result because um, I'm a new farmer. Uh, there's still a long learning curve for me and I'm always behind the schedule, pruning the leaves and, uh, and the suckers, but still they are doing great this year. So I'm pretty happy with this result. And I have started my seedlings. Most of them are uh, cabbages and cauliflowers and some Chinese variety uh, vegetables. So when I pull out the tomatoes, I will replace them with these leafy veggies. So that way I can uh, grow tomatoes, uh, grow vegetables year round. So they will be cut in February, late February, before I transplant uh, tomatoes next year. So according to the performance uh, of during the last year, I made a, a growing plan for next year. So next year I will start tomato seedlings uh, really early, in early January. This year uh, I had a lot of trouble. Uh, I only transplanted my tomatoes in April, early April. But next year I will try to transplant it uh, in early March, a month earlier. So. Uh, in, uh, in, in March this year, uh, the outside temperature dropped down to minus three, but it was just for one or two days. And uh, the temperature inside the greenhouse dropped down to five minimum. So it was still uh, pretty safe for my uh, tomatoes. So next year, it makes me uh, be able to transplant it much earlier. So we, we will see better results next year. Um, before I transplant them, I will cut the cauliflowers and cabbages, the leafy veggies. And then uh, I will start to pick tomatoes in early June and all the way until late November, early December. Uh, where, uh, when uh, I can replace them with new leafy veggies. So in that way, we can grow year round. And I have some tentative conclusions. Uh, I don't need to read this, I think. Uh, I just want to say that uh, Chinese style passive solar greenhouse is pretty cost effective and uh, environmentally friendly. And uh, uh, giving correct uh, varieties, we can grow year round in Alberta. Uh, so let's let our greenhouse go real green. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tiani. That was great. Um, I always find your presentation so interesting. It's really, it's really neat to see what you can do in like December and January in your greenhouse. Yeah. Um, so I have some questions that came up in the chat box. Um, and then I also had some questions emailed to me beforehand from people that weren't able to attend at the last minute. So I will start, I will start the question and answer period by asking you those questions um, because some people may have the same questions um, and then your questions will be answered. Um, 
And then once I get through those, I'll kind of open the floor up to everybody that's here. And if you have any questions you'd like Gianni to answer directly, um, you can just unmute yourself and we will ask. So um, the first question, Gianni, was uh, how do you balance the need to keep heat inside the greenhouse in the colder months with the need um, for ventilation to keep disease down? Yeah, that's, that's very, very important question. Um, in the cold season, we just, our first priority is temperature. But uh, if it's really humid, uh, there's too much disease. So uh, as long as I can keep a minimum, um, uh, how to say, a minimum temperature that uh, the tomatoes can grow, I will keep it down. I just went, I just went. So I just opened the windows to let out the humid air into the outside. So uh, to keep the moisture down, uh, even though it can be, the temperature can drop down to 10 degrees, that's, that's fine with me. But uh, when it's, um, uh, that, that's only the concern during the uh, cloudy days. When it's sunny, we don't have that the problem at all. So I just had a question here in the chat box that came up um, asking to go back to that slide, Gianni, where, um, where you had your conclusions. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so next question um, that I received. Do you have any tips for dealing with aphids, white flies, or other pest outbreaks um, inside your greenhouse? Yes, uh, for tomato and cucumbers, they are not bothered at least for me, they're not bothered by this pest. Uh, they, I think this pest just don't like to eat them. Mm -hmm. But for, for example, uh, peppers and long beans, they, there are too many aphids. But uh, so you can buy some uh, uh, beneficial insects to eat them, like ladybugs, or I believe there's some uh, uh, biological technology to control them. Uh, it's not uh, chemical, but it's something you can spray on the plants, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next question, sorry, we have quite a few questions. Yeah. Um, at what temperature do you start unraveling that insulated blanket to cover the south side at night? Yeah, I tr uh, uh, in the warm seasons, I try to keep the temperature, minimum temperature about 15 degrees. So I close all the windows at about 20 to 18. And when it drops down to 16, then I close the insulated blankets and the temperature will just stay at 16. It won't drop like in between uh, May and uh, uh, September. So uh, it won't drop during the night. Well, during the very cold season, like November, or, uh, December, then I, close insulated blankets at about 20 degrees. Next question, where do you start your warm weather crops? Do you start those inside the greenhouse or do you start those seedlings elsewhere? Oh, I start them in, the, in, the, in my greenhouse. So I make a smaller greenhouse inside my greenhouse and in January. Uh, so I give them heat because the seedlings takes a very small place, very small area. So I can give them heat, I can give them light with LED lights. So it's, the cost is pretty low. Mm -hmm. uh, they will stay in that the small greenhouse for two months before mm -hmm. I transplant them. Okay. But they are always staying in my uh, greenhouse, the big greenhouse. And then I just have a question here in the chat box from Sharon. Do you open the windows manually, um, those windows that let the ventilation in? Are those open manually? And are there any alarms that indicate that temperatures are too high or too low? Okay, uh, there's smart controller. Uh, I have a um, sensor, uh, so it shows on the screen, on the screen of the controller, if it's too high or low. Uh, and you can set it uh, automatic mode, but right now I use manual mode because it, we not only worry about the temperature, but also the humidity. So uh, sometimes even it's cold, the temperature is low, but the humidity is too high, I still open it. 
So right now I use manual mode and it's not too bad. So I have one more question here in the chat box about, um, this is about the material that you use for that back wall. Um, and we're just wondering if um, the, the ga Gabion baskets, that um, if those could be used for the back wall. So it's basically a wire basket filled with rock if you think that would be suitable for a back wall or would that let out too much heat too quickly? Uh, yeah, well, if, if the rock is too big, mm -hmm. it's not good because he, uh, the back wall is not only a heat source, but also it's insulation. So uh, if you use big rocks, you need to uh, fill it with sand. Okay. Yeah, fine sand. That's yeah. all the spaces. Yeah, to fill the spaces. And uh, the reason I use uh, clay is clay is free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I take the clay from my dugout mm -hmm. and put it in the in the wall. Okay. And it works fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Here's one more question. <laughs> are, there, um, are there vegetable varieties that are bred specifically for growing in solar greenhouses in China? Not really. I think all the vegetables are the same. Okay. It's a, yeah, there's not a special <coughs> vegetable <coughs> mm -hmm. bread for the greenhouse. Mm. So like my the, the tomatoes in my greenhouse, I can grow them in my greenhouse and I can also green them outside. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do seedlings two times. In January, uh, I do uh, seedlings for my greenhouse in uh, April, I start another uh, set of seedlings and then I move them out in June. So uh, in my field, there's also tomatoes too. Mm -hmm. So they are the same uh, variety. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so another question in the chat box, um, can we buy the, the insulating blankets here from Canada? Um, and did you also build the metal framework of the greenhouse yourself? It's uh, pretty difficult to find the similar insulated blankets in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, so I brought everything from China. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you can, you, you can do the same thing. You can order it from China and put them in a container and ship them here. It's okay. not really difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, if you really want to build a greenhouse like this, you can do that. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I welded everything myself. Uh, the first greenhouse took me uh, a whole year to finish. It, it was just me and my wife. My wife uh, drives the tractor and I do all the uh, welding. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm building the second greenhouse. Yeah, yeah. Wow. that's really great. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I don't think I missed any questions in the chat box, but I'm just going to give everyone um, an opportunity. If you want to ask Gianni a question directly, um, feel free to just um, unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself down at um, the bottom left of your screen um, and feel free, yeah, ask Gianni any questions that you have directly. I have a question. It's Michael from, uh, from British Columbia. Out there in Alberta, you guys have got lots and lots of opportunity opportunity to get straw, a straw uh, a bales. And it seems to me that those bales would stack together and at how deep you want to go are an excellent insulation. And if you cover them, they don't rot. It, it, has anybody tried that? Here, I don't think anybody tried that, I, or I don't know, actually. But in China, people tried that, and it worked fine. Uh, but the only thing is you better compress the straw bale. So when you compress it really hard, they, became, they become hard like rock, and you can stack them together, make a back wall, and it works really well in China. And it's even uh, fireproof. But if it's loose, uh, it's not good because it can get wet re real quick and uh, it, uh, it has uh, mold and the, uh, the mildew. Uh, I have a question. This is Joe from uh, New Jersey, Rutgers University. 
What is more important about that back wall, that it's uh, insulating uh, material or that it's a, a heat sink? Or is it both? Mm, I think it's both. Uh, in China, mm, because they use a clay burn, so they never had to worry about insulating the burn because it's so big. But here, my wall is only one meter thick, so I need to insulate it. But if you don't, uh, you don't use the clay, sometimes uh, somewhere in China, they don't have a back wall with the clay. They just have insulation, like the foam or insulated blankets or the straw. Uh, it worked fine, but the, their weather is uh, much nicer. Uh, it's um, minimum temperature is just minus 10 for a couple of days. But here in Alberta, we need the, the clay, the, the heat uh, source, the heat pool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, if anybody else has any questions, um, feel free to just use the unmute button and um, ask Gianni. Um, it's a great opportunity to ask your questions now while we have them. Um, so I'll just, I'll just open up the floor. If anybody else wants to speak, go ahead. Um, I'll also check the chat box to see if there's any questions in there. Hi, Marie. Hi. It's uh, Harvey from Athabasca, Marie's home territory. <laughs> hi, Harvey. Uh, hi. Thanks so much. It was a great presentation, uh, Johnny. Uh, I have uh, long ago built my uh, place for my greenhouse, not, not the size of yours, uh, against my south wall. So the south wall uh, is designed to act like a trome wall and take some of the heat from it as well. But uh, my question is simple. Did you get your pipe, you're sourcing your pipe and your, your plastic from, from here in Alberta, or you, can you suggest a, a supply or uh, is that appropriate? Oh, I source uh, everything from China. Okay. Uh, because yeah, it's a uh, mm, very special design and specially manufactured. So I don't think we can find a supplier here. So getting the, the proper uh, curvature for latitude here, we're almost 55 degrees. Uh, so you have them bend it there as well, or do you bend it here? Uh, they bend it there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And the frame is not only uh, bended, it's, um, it's not uh, round, it's uh, oval. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's um, uh, seven, uh, seven centimeter uh, wide, and uh, the th and this in this direction is only three, so it's like this uh, mm -hmm. shape, and it's also a bent uh, arc. Okay. So yeah. And and Maria, if there's if there's no one else immediately, uh, did you have did you have to insulate down to some some people say you have to insulate down to the frost line underneath. Did you bother with a lot of insulation underneath, or just use it uh, for further uh, heat storage? I actually uh, buried some foam in the in the ground, but I I don't think it's really necessary because uh, in winter time we don't grow tomatoes in December or January. It's uh, just a uh, uh, very very challenging unless you you use artificial source right because it's too dark here if you want to grow tomatoes year round you'd better insulate it uh, in underground otherwise uh, i think it's fine you don't need to use it yeah. great thank thanks again yeah you're welcome um, one last question from Joe in, in New Jersey. Uh, what was your base, uh, average soil temperature in the greenhouse during the winter months? Uh, I actually didn't uh, test it, but I have a, a, a thermometer uh, on, on the surf, on the, uh, on the ground. So uh, during January, they, when the minimum temperature dropped down to uh, minus 38 here, uh, the minimum reading in the greenhouse on the uh, ground was five degrees. So the soil was still warm, uh, but the air temperature in the greenhouse dropped down to minus four, minus three, minus four. So there's a big difference. 
Can, uh, it's Wayne and Red Deer. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if I know you have those vibrators to keep the snow load off, but did you uh, have them uh, decrease the interval of the struts? Like I have a, a, a greenhouse kind of along that style and and uh, my trusses were, were, I felt were gonna be too far apart. So I, I, I made a hundred foot greenhouse down to 60 feet just because I thought the snow load was gonna to be too high, but did you make any, when you ordered yours, did you specify what the spacing was on the trusses? We made the design based on the experience, exper experience in China. So uh, some, in some extreme cases, uh, they have also 30 centimeter thick uh, snow load. Uh, so they, they use uh, one meter and one one uh, point two one point two meters spacing. Uh, if you really worry about the snow load, uh, reduce it to one point one meters, and that's uh, more than enough. Okay. But that, that also depends on the strength of your material, the uh, steel tubing. Last chance to unmute yourself and ask a question um, now if you'd like to have Gianni answer it. Um, if not, you can always send me an email and I can reach out to Gianni um, and we can get your questions answered that way. Sometimes you, you percolate on things and you come up with, with a question that you wish you had asked. So, so don't worry, there's always, there's always a chance to get your question answered later. Uh, before I say goodbye, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. And a big thank you to Gianni for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much, Gianni, for taking the time today to, to talk about greenhouses. Thank you, Marie. Yeah, okay. Well, everyone take care. Have a great afternoon. Um, oh, here's a question, Gianni. Um, sorry, <laughs> before we go. What would be the annual water consumption for your greenhouse? You mentioned a dugout. Is, is this your supply? Yes, my dugout is my only supply because the groundwater here is salty. There's too much salt in the ground. So I'm, I have a dugout and uh, I collect the spring runoff. And I didn't calculate uh, uh, the annual water uh, consumption because uh, I don't use a hydroponic, I use soil. And the soil holds the water really well. So I just water once a week or uh, once in 10 days mm -hmm. uh, during very hot season once a week uh, right now uh, 10 days so uh, every time i i use uh, see about uh, two or three uh, cubic meters water mm -hmm. so it's, it's very very little okay uh, um yeah, and tomatoes, um, you don't give them too much water, they, they're really sweet. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. Um, I think we have another question here, so um, so go ahead. Uh, Marie, I just wanted to ask um, if um, in January when the sun is not really uh, hot uh, and, and there's not a lot of it, does he still have adequate just from the solar panels in January or does he store energy? Uh, I don't have solar panels at all. Oh. I, yeah, okay. so the greenhouse is like a uh, heat collector, the greenhouse itself. So oh, I it see. Collects, you receive the heat, uh, this heat from the sunlight and keep the heat inside the greenhouse. So, so uh, uh, I don't have any artificial heat source. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Gianni, there's a few more questions that have popped up in the chat box. <laughs> okay. So this is good. I'm glad that everybody's asking. Um, so how are you watering when you do water inside the greenhouse? Are you using drip lines? Yeah, drip tape. Okay. So, or I can, maybe I can show you. Sure. Papers. So before we plant, uh, plant all the tomatoes, so we make a hill here. So this is the ground and this higher than the ground. We put the soil uh, from into the center. And so uh, we grow the tomatoes on 
on the top of it and it's covered by a plastic mulch mm -hmm. and this is the drip tape under the mulch so uh, the greenhouse is about 10 and half meters wide outside the inside is about eight and a half meters but uh, we need some spacing for the for the for for us to walk so the uh, the space for rowing is seven meters. So every lane is seven meters long and the drip tapes are seven meters long too. And I have uh, 50 uh, lanes. So do you require drainage in the greenhouse? Mm, no, no, because I use soil. Uh, we don't need to, it, like, if you use hydroponic, you need to wash the mm -hmm. growing medium, and so you need drainage. Here, no, just drip tape. You drip it, the water with the fertilizer into the soil, and the plant absorb the fertilizer and the water and uh, evaporate. So uh, the sunlight will do the drainage. Okay. When it's warm, yeah. When it's warm enough, uh, the water will evaporate. evaporate away. Uh, okay, so question. Um, did you originally build in soil or just use the soil that was there and then um, amend it with compost? Oh, yeah, I built the greenhouse on the soil. The soil is just a, a in situ soil. Uh, I didn't bring it from anywhere. The soil is pretty good. It's full of organic matter, uh, but I also amend it with uh, compost every year. Uh, so in this way, you grow tomatoes in soil with compost. It's super tasty. Mm -hmm. so my my customers love my tomatoes so much. Yeah, if you use um, fertilizers only, uh, I don't. I mean the chemical fertilizers, and it's not as tasty as mine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What is the minimum height of the back wall that you suggest in a passive solar greenhouse? Uh, there are different designs. So in China, I, I see two meters, two meter tall back wall is uh, probably the minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, because our greenhouses are pretty tall, so we'd better use a tall uh, back wall. Oh, um, I, I missed a question earlier in the chat box. So Nicole asked um, what type of compost you use when you amend the soil with compost. It's, I think it's the green bean compost. It, government uh, collect the green bean and I, I bought it from uh, Calgary. Uh, I pay $800 and, and they uh, deliver it with a big truck. And that's the reason why I I, I transplanted these tomatoes late this year. I uh, I planned to trans uh, transplant them in March, but I was waiting the compost to melt. There was it was covered by snow and frozen on the ground, and nobody can sell me the compost. So next year, uh, I think the com uh, compost. I, maybe I will use compost once every two years and. And then I use uh, uh, some other growing mediums, uh, a peat moss. I've used peat moss to amend the soil. So I can buy peat moss anytime. And it can keep this soil uh, loose. And it worked well. One last time, Jenny, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing this, this knowledge and all the work that you've put into your own passive solar greenhouse. So thanks again, everyone. And thanks one last time, Jani. Thank you so much. If you'd like to learn more about what we can do for your part of rural Alberta, please visit our website at rr2cs.ca.